Hi hey everyone, my name is Valentin. Uh, I'm a founder and lead engineer in Novo Wallet. And today we are going to talk about uh, cross-chain transfers for, from parachain builder's perspective. So what do you need to integrate it to your own parachain, what things to look on, and so on. So the main goal of this talk is to give you an understanding on how trans cross-chain transfers work, how to integrate it uh, into your own parachain. In, in order to achieve that, we are going to split uh, the talk into four main sections. First one, we will quick, quickly review an XCM just for everyone to be on the same page. Uh, then we will go to cover some basic theory regarding cross-chain transfers. Uh, then there will be like practical part regarding what do you need to do from the code, code's, uh, code side to integrate XCM and cross-chain transfers into parachain. And fi finally, uh, I will give you some hints uh, in, from client's perspective, because like I'm working no wallet and we uh, face cross-chain transfers a lot. And I will like tip you on how to make client's integration easier. So let's start uh, by quickly overviewing an XCM, because it's like foundation for everything, uh, and we, we need to be on the same page. So I what is in an XCM? XCM is just a message format. So it's nothing more than just a language for every consensus system to be uh, to, to communicate with each other. It's like it's like if all humans would have a uh, single language, everyone will, will speak. Um, since XM is like just a message format, it does not enforce any specific rules for transporting those messages. Uh, and basically, um, there are. For, uh, it, it is done by means of transport protocols. Currently, there are four of them. Each serves each its unique purpose. There are UMP, DMP, XMP, and RMP, which is also referred as XMP Lite. So uh, UMP stands for upward message passing, and it's used to pass messages from parachain to relay chain. Uh, DMP is the other way around. It's downward message passing, and it's used to pass messages from relay chain to parachain. Uh, XMP is for passing messages between parachain to parachain without uh, touching too much the relay chain. Uh, HRMP is uh, like predecessor of uh, XMP. It's deprecated, so uh, you shouldn't worry about it too much because XMP is now live and it's more like effective. Uh, now let's talk about the major comp and the most, let's say, complex component of XM format, which is a multi-location. So. Since XCM, like it's a universal message format, multi-location, it's universal location system. So it allows different consensus systems, like different blockchains, which might have different environments, different logic, to, uh, like, in the same way, identify locations. So the beauty of multi-location is that it can, it can identify everything. So you can identify, you can locate accounts, you can locate parachains, you can locate tokens with the same format. Um, it is achieved by uh, the main idea behind multi-location is to look on everything as a tree. So like account is a node, is a li leaf node on the tree, uh, a token is a leaf node, and uh, like parachain is a node on the tree. So uh, in order to achieve that, uh, multi-location has two, two major components. It's like a number of parents you should go up and then the list of nodes, you should go down. So if you will think about it, it's actually enough to identify every path in a tree. You, you just say, OK, I go up n times, and then go down by n nodes. So he, here you can see a few examples how it can be used. So for example, if we want from parachain A to identify our sibling parachain B, we first let's say, OK, we firstly go up to relay chain, and then go down to parachain with uh, location B. The same way you can identify location of a token. So here we are viewing uh, a specific case from relay chain po point of view. So we firstly go down to parachain B, and then uh, to a pilot instance with index, des uh, index 10, sorry. Uh, so which let's assume it's a balances pilot. Uh, since balances pilot is like has only one token, it's enough to uniquely identify the to uh, this token. So we do not introduce any redundancy here. Uh, the same thing with account location. Uh, we start from relay chain, we go to parachain B, and then to a specific uh, like path segment called account ID uh, 32, which is corresponds to uh, like supplying address basically of an account. 
Uh, and now, once we like dis discussed briefly what XM is and what parts of XM is, we can move on to cross chain transfer theory. So, um, the most primitive uh, kind of cross chain transfers are teleports. Uh, so teleports is basically, it's pretty simple concept. It's like burn on one side, mint on another side. Um, while it's pretty simple and efficient to implement, uh, it has major, uh, one major drawback. It's that uh, both participating parties should trust each other. Because uh, if uh, sending side would say, I burn the tokens, without burning the tokens, it would actually introduce quite a problem of unlimited, potentially unlimited, like minting a token on destination chain. So uh, yeah, parties should tr trust each other. And if you think about it, it's like, it's, it's quite a problem because blockchain, uh, is, like idea of blockchain is focused around trustless environments. So if you require someone to trust each other, it might be uh, quite a challenge. Uh, so currently, that's why the teleports are currently used between relay chain and common good parachains like Polkadot and state, state, state Mint. Yeah, uh, that's because common good parachains like state Mint are completely ruled and governed by relay chain itself. Uh, so relay chain can be sure that uh, common good parachains are like in 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 good faith. Uh, to mitigate the issue of uh, trust requirements. We can move. We can like use reserve transfers. But before before moving on to discussing different kind of reserve transfers, let's stop and discuss some concepts which are involved. So firstly, uh, there's a notion of reserve chain. So for if we consider some token, for example, DOT, uh, it has like the origin chain, which like the true source of these tokens. So for DOT is Polkadot, for ACA token it's Akala. So the chain that is true source of tokens is a reserve chain. Uh, and this chain will actually play a, a, a big role in reserve transfers. Then there is a notion of sovereign account. It's like an embassy of one parachain on another one. So as a, for example, uh, Moonbeam might have a specific a uh, special account on Polkadot, which will represent Moonbeam on Polkadot. So why this account is needed? So the main, one of the goals, of this, one of the reasons this account exists is that this account may store uh, tokens of resort, uh, of resort chain. So uh, in Moonbeam account on Polkadot, Moonbeam can store its like real DOT tokens, which uh, will be like a backing for token, for DOT token on Moonbeam. So the dot token on Moonbeam is not nothing more than, than just a derivative that is backed by real dot tokens which are on Polkadot. So that's why sovereign account exists. And regarding trust requirements, uh, in this case we still need to trust, but only to trust the reserve chain. So if you have two chains that for some reason do not trust each other, but they both trust a reserve, it is still will be possible to conduct a cross-chain transfer between them for some token that is on reserve chain. Uh, so there are three kinds of reserve transfers uh, based on like which chain is a reserve. So if like origin chain is a reserve, it's called from reserve because we are sending tokens from reserve. If uh, the destination chain is a reserve uh, for the sending token, it's called to reserve because we are sending tokens from some parachain to reserve chain. And finally, if neither origin nor uh, destination chain is a reserve, uh, we call it non-reserve because there is a third-party chain, reserve chain, which is involved. Uh, Nextly, we will review some diagrams. So here is the legend. Um, we will use uh, this uh, icon to indicate a sovereign account of parachain B. So here will be letter of parachain of chain, uh, like which reserve it is. Uh, then there, here is icons for minting, burning, and uh, transferring at an asset. So now let's start with uh, from reserve transfers. Uh, so here, chain A is a reserve chain because we are doing from reserve transfer. And chain B is a destination chain. Uh, and one, once transaction is initiated from sender, uh, the tokens uh, get transferred from sender account to sovereign account of B on A. So it's like an embassy of B on A. Uh, once chain A does that, it sends the message to chain B saying, hey, I just top up your sovereign account. 
uh, in order for you to give some token to recipient. Uh, since chain B trusts chain A, it's requirement for reserve transfers, uh, he can safely mint derivative token and uh, in favor of recipient. Um, yeah, note that chain A doesn't need to uh, on uh, doesn't need to trust chain B because he only moves like tokens uh, uh, between its own accounts without minting, burning, or doing everything like dangerous. Um, two reserve transfers are kind of similar, but the other way around. So uh, we start with origin chain A, uh, where sender wants to send some money from chain A to chain B to recipient. Um, so firstly, chain A burns the tokens he won uh, sender wants to send. Then it notifies chain B, which is a reserve chain, saying, hey, I just burned my derivatives. Uh, can you please move some funds from my embassy, like my sovereign account, to the recipient? Um, chain B does exactly that, and thus the recipient gets like reserve, real reserve tokens. Again, chain B doesn't have to trust chain A because, um, because it only moves tokens uh, between its own accounts and doesn't meet or burn anything. Uh, even if chain A is for some kind malicious, for some reason ma is malicious and decided to tell chain B to burn tokens without actually burning them, it's actually bad for him only because he will lose backing from its sovereign account without burning the derivative. So it will actually create like uh, unbacked tokens on chain A, which is pretty bad for, for only for him. It's bad. It's bad only for him. So for for it. Sorry. Uh, so. Uh, that was two reserve transfers. Finally, the most complex case. Uh, it is the last diagram. Uh, it is non-reserve transfer. So here, neither chain A, which is the origin, nor chain B, which is destination, are reserve chains for transferring token. So they have to call for help for real reserve chain. And it all starts with, again, sender, sub sending, ser sender submi by submitting transaction. Uh, and assets getting burned on chain A side. Once tokens is, uh, are burned, chain A notifies, uh, notifies reserve chain uh, to move tokens between embassy of A and embassy of B, like sovereign accounts. Uh, this is required because we want to, at the end, we want, want to move tokens to chain B, so we want to preserve one-to-one -one backing and want, like, it, and thus we are required to move from A, from A sovereign account to B sovereign account on R, on R. Uh, after this transfer is done, chain R notifies chain B saying, hey, I just moved some tokens in your favor so you can top up the recipient. Uh, since chain B trusts reserve, since everyone trusts reserve, if they want to communicate, um, he can safely mint new tokens, uh, new, its derivative to the recipient. Uh, so you can like ask, wait, should I actually handle it all by myself? Because it's like a lot of logic, different corner cases. I mean, in the code, if you, when you are writing the code, it's actually you know you don't need to because there is a uh, pre-built palette called X tokens, uh, which deals with all kind of reserve transfers and uh, under a single interface. Uh, so there, uh, but one major question still remains: like, how does X tokens determine? Uh, which kind of transfer is used, which chain is a reserve, because it, do, it doesn't know. Uh, and the answer is that it looks at the location, multi-location of an asset you supply to it. So uh, it looks, it, it specifically looks, uh, as in this example, sorry, as, as, this, as in this example, it specifically looks for this uh, path segment, uh, parachain something. Uh, and once it finds it, it, uh, Trades this uh, node. It uh, it trades this segment as being like the reserve chain. So th that's why it is imp it is important when interacting with X tokens to supply location of a token on reserve chain because you might have dot on Polka dot dot on Moonbeam dot on Akala, but when interacting with X tokens, you always need to supply location of reserve. So in this case, it will be Polka dot chain. Yeah. Uh, one small note regarding commission. It is pretty simple. Commissions, it's paid everywhere where you execute something. So it is paid on origin chain by means of submitting transaction. And then uh, you pay fee on reserve and you pay fee on destination. So, and it introduces some, uh, 
some no, not issues, but incon inconveniences because uh, when you want to send one dot, uh, you will actually end up receiving less because like reserve chain will get some bit of it, destination chain will get, will, will get some bit of it, and you will receive like 0 0.99 something in, in the best case. So now let's discuss how what you, what you actually will need to integrate cross-chain transfers into your own parachain. Well, like in order to integrate cross-chain transfers, you need to integrate the whole XCM because cross-chain transfers is just like a part of XCM world. Um, so you need, uh, so since XCM is pretty abstract and unified way for all consensus system to communicate, you should uh, provide like a few um, implementations, specific implementations for your chain uh, in order to cross boundary between your on-chain world and XCM world. So what do we need to actually like do if you, for XCM to work? Firstly, we need to know how should, how should we weigh uh, an XM message? It is important to it is important to prevent denial denial of service attack and some other stuff. Yeah, so we need to know how much weight uh, would XM message cost. And XM itself doesn't does it has a notion of weight, but it's like just like a number. It doesn't enforce any rules for weighting a message. It's actually your responsibility to do uh, to determine how to do so. Uh, this corresponds to waiter uh, argument in XCM config for everyone who is familiar with pilot configurations. Um, then we need to know how, how to calculate fees. So um, we want to charge fees for executing XCM once we waited a message. So uh, we want to like, know how much fees should we take. And the tricky thing here is that you in best scenario, you should do best effort to support as many fee assets as possible because in XCM, uh, you can specify which asset you want to use as a fee. And like, of course, you can reject every, everything uh, besides your native asset. But for flexibility of users, you should do best effort when and support as much tokens as possible. So at least try to support tokens which you support in your chain. It is corresponds to trader argument of uh, XCM config. And finally, uh, we want to tell like XCM virtual machine how to uh, deposit, withdraw, and transfer tokens around our own chain because again, XCM is very abstract. It doesn't know you're using balances. It doesn't know you're using uh, assets. It doesn't know you're using uh, ORML tokens. It corresponds to asset transactor, tra asset transactor argument. So now let's discuss like each of this in detail. And we'll start with waiting a message. So uh, the trade we will need to implement is weight bounce trade. And it basically uh, asks you to implement two methods, one for waiting single instruction and one to, uh, to wait in uh, the message itself. And um, currently, mostly used implementation is fixed weight bounce. It's like a preset reasonable default implementation, uh, which basically assigns a constant weight for each instruction. Uh, and the sa and the and it calculates the weight of a message as a just sum of all instructions. It's pretty easy. It works nice, and it's used like 99% uh, on each parachain. So you can consider using it if you don't need some custom stuff. Uh, this fee calculation it's ma it's a, bit, a little bit more trickier because you can approach it differently. Uh, for your native asset, so for example, if um, XCM message comes and asks you to pay fees in your native asset, you can just use reuse transaction payment uh, because like it's already there. Why do we need to bother? However, if you use uh, a token that your native is not your native, so you do not support no, like on-chain payments in this token, you should come up with some way to mm, multiply the weight. So you, you, you're given the weight and an asset, you're required to output the fee, the, the amount of token that will be taken. So that's why, that's why usually, well, it's a usually the most commonly used approach is just to multiply the weight by some, some multiplier. Uh, you, uh, you can just, um, by your own, assign some multiplier for each token you want to support. But it might be tedious because uh, the token like you, you will need to maintain this coefficient and update once you, the, it's required. So you can uh, use some, some other approaches. For example, one that I've seen in several parachains. It is 
a ratio of minimum balance. So like minimum balance can serve as a kind of indirect uh, measure of value. So if, for example, you consider key BTC, which like Bitcoin basically a uh, version in, in Kintsugi, you certainly don't want uh, minimum balance of key BTC to be one because uh, Bitcoin is pricely, pricey, it costs m a lot. And setting, and setting a minimum balance for Bitcoin to be one is like pretty costly for users. So, uh, and this works the other way around. So you can kind of use a minimum balance ratio between your native token and target token as a kind of coefficient uh, to the fee. And finally, you can come up with your own custom logic. For example, there are some chains that have on-chain DEX, which stands for uh, decentralized exchange. So they have, they have some liquidity pairs with some rates. They use it to determine coefficients uh, based on the real market uh, value of a token from their perspective. And finally, uh, you should tell XCM pilots how, to, how would you like to deposit, withdraw, and transfer assets. Uh, that is defined by transact asset trade. Uh, it also contains some optional methods for teleport house, house, housekeeping. I won't uh, stop on this because it's like it's really, really used since uh, parchains don't use teleports between each other, but you can consult transact asset uh, documentation. It's pretty nice. Uh, there's already a, uh, a reason, a reasonably good implementation which is called currency adapter. It's like an implementation of transact assets that works in most of the cases for most of use cases. There is also some templates available for balances palette, assets palette, and ORML tokens palette, which those three are the most commonly used uh, palettes for managing your tokens. Uh, so if you are using those palettes, you can, you can just reuse currency adapter. It's pretty quick to reuse. Yeah, finally, uh, let's move on to cross-chain transfers from client's perspective. So since I'm working in No Wallet, we faced a lot, uh, we work a lot with cross-chain transfers. Uh, we support like 200 directions on both Kusama and Polkadot. And uh, yeah, so I, I can tell you something, <laughs> yeah. So uh, what clients should, uh, should know in order to support cross-chain transfers? Firstly, it obviously need to know which directions are available. Like, like if you have, if I am selecting Kusam, Kusam token, where can I send, where can I send it to? Uh, then I need some knowledge of how to construct a call to submit transaction. And finally, I need to know how how to collect, calculate a fee. It's like an optional thing, but it incredibly increases the user experience because user wants to see how much it will be charged from the transaction, cross-chain transaction. So for each of these direction, I will uh, like give you some suggestions, uh, like how you can ma make it easier for us clients. So wallets, the apps, to make it easier for, uh, for us to integrate your cross-chain transfers. Uh, there is no currently available RPC calls or whatever to get directions. They are not exposed from runtime. So it would be great to, uh, to come up with some kind of unified RPC calls for this. Uh, so we can basic, we, we won't need to hard code it in some configuration files, but retrieve it dynamically from your chain. Uh, now regarding call construction, it's pretty, uh, the situation is pretty good here. We only have X tokens in Palit XCM. So it's pretty easy to handle, not so much cases out there. But there is one issue that um, makes it a little bit difficult. It's, you know, it's, how, it's related to how different chains uh, handle multi-locations. So for example, assume you're on Akala chain and you want to express location of Aka token. So you can say like Aka token is like my token, my native token, so I'm saying it's just here. Like multi-location has a special path segment called here to indicate it's exactly here. You don't need to go to somewhere. Um, however, on the other side, you can say it in a bit different way. You can say, I'm on Akala, so I can go to Relay Chain and back to Akala. It sounds a little bit strange, but it's actually uh, used quite a lot on separate, uh, on several parachains, like Ponbeam. I, I think Ponbeam uses it. Yeah, so um, it still works. It's still valid from like multi-location perspective, and like it's, it makes sense, but uh, it just introduces this inconsistency. So it would be good to agree on some single option to do it. 
And finally, regarding fee calculation, um, since we saw previously there are multiple ways you can approach fee calculation, it is also pretty hard for uh, wallets and clients to and other clients to uh, determine how exact much fee will be, will be charged. We try in Nova, we try to estimate it based on like the way you do it in code. So we go case by case, uh, analyze it. Uh, analyze your Rust code uh, to determine how can we estimate it uh, with our best effort. But yeah, uh, so it would be great to like have a RPC call which we can call again this fee. It would be great. Um, I, I guess that's it for the presentation part. I want to just give you a, a small demo for cross chain transfer. Uh, I guess, I think for, yeah, likely Polkadot.js is not reset up. So we can, uh, we will go through this call. And uh, uh, see like the, which parts like correspond to which one. I will also have a Nova wallet open here, just so you can see uh, balances, how they update in real time, how much does it take to update, like to transfer to come through, and so on. So le let's now focus on the right part. So we will be performing uh, X tokens transfer. It's like a pallet, which I, I was talking about previously. Uh, and we want to transfer, uh, we, will, we will do a from reserve transfer. So we will transfer car token uh, from Karura to Bifrost. So uh, Karura is the reserve for car token, so it's from reserve transfer. Uh, however, it doesn't matter much for us because we are using X token, so it handles it automatically. So firstly, the first argument uh, for transfer is like an asset. Like it's a multi-location of, as I said previously, it's a multi-location of reserve. Of, uh, of assets of, of asset you are transferring on reserve chain. Uh, you can, like, we won't talk about what is a concrete and not concrete. We will focus uh, specifically on this part. Uh, so please take a look on this part. So as I was uh, say, uh, display, uh, presenting previously, there are two major components. It's like a number of parents go up, and then this list of uh, path segments, you go down. So we are on Karura chain. And we want to express, like, in the Karura uses absolute locations, by the way. So uh, we want to express location of a car token. So we firstly go up to relay chain and then back to, uh, to Karura chain, its ID of Karura. And then uh, this, I, this, this general key ID is ID of car token inside Karura. Then we indicate that this token is fungible. So you can actually, with XM, you can also transfer like NFTs by non-fungible means, but it's not quite used yet, but in theory you can. So uh, this amount is like 0 0.1 Karuras in uh, Planks. It's like zero, 11 zeros here. Uh, so it's all about specifying the asset you want to transfer. Uh, the second argument is the destination. Uh, so basically, where do we want to transfer car, uh, car tokens? Uh, again, we want to focus uh, on this part. We want to transfer to Bifrost. Uh, Bifrost is a sibling parachain, so it's like another parachain on Kusama with ID, with this ID. So we say, okay, go, go up to relay chain, then uh, come down to parachain uh, 2001, and then to this specific account. So it's like, and uh, uh, this is the same uh, I'm saying I'm sending from my uh, uh, Karura address to the same address in Bifrost. See, the icon is the same. So yeah, we are basically transferring between uh, like our own accounts, but cross chain. And finally, there is uh, extra argument called destination weight, which says like how much weight do we want to at maximum consume at Bifrost. So uh, here is like number, you don't need to worry about it, it's just number that works. Uh, it's basically size of weight of instruction multiplied by the number of instructions. And now let's submit it. I hope it will work. So now, now let's take a look at the left side on Nova. Um, we are waiting for transaction to be sub to, to block to be produced on Karura for like it's to be applied. So see, uh, balance got uh, reduced, uh, and now we will wait for. Oh, it actually seems to be already updated on Bifrost. I don't remember what it was at the beginning. Ah, no, now it is updated. So uh, as you have seen, it took like 10 seconds for transfer to arrive to Bifrost, and that's because 
uh, firstly, uh, Karura should produce a block, uh, then Relay Chain should produce a block, and then um, Bifrost should produce a block. Uh, and now let's take a look at what is happened at Bifrost side. Let's go to events. So you can see that uh, we got some tokens deposited to our account uh, as a result of XCM execution. Uh, and finally, I think uh, I want to like quickly, uh, quickly um, let you take a look at what we are trying to approach as the clients when we, when we design user interface for cross-chain transfers. So, if we, if we will, if we would like to do the same from uh, no wallet, we would go to like send, uh, then sele uh, then select one of the networks which is supported. In this case, it be Frost Kusama. Uh, choose amount. And we, we will uh, see how much fee is calculated for uh, origin chain and for cross chain. Then we uh, will submit, review, sub review and submit. Um, and it's basically the same transactions that are shown you in Polkadot.js, but uh, where our client interface. So now you see uh, money got uh, transferred from Karura. And soon, like in a few seconds, they're going to arrive to Bifrost Kusama. A chain. Yeah. So uh, that's it for my demo. It was a small one. So now I'm ready to answer your questions. So do, do I get it right that at the, ter at the destination uh, blockchain, you were paid, the miner was paid with. Uh, Coins from the origin, actually. Yeah, uh, it's not the miner who got paid, but the collector. Yes, it's uh, different terms in uh, Polkadot and Kusama. Uh, but yeah, you are right that like we paid transaction fee on origin. Uh, we we transferred some money to destination, and destination took a bit of it for its fees. So yeah. Okay. How do you open the sovereign? account in another chain in the first place? Yeah, it's actually, um, it's like after generated account, so um, it's hard coded in the logic of Polycode how you generate it. It's basically you take in, I don't know, I don't remember how exactly it's done, but you hash in something with parachain ID, you get uh, a account. So it is, you don't need to generate it, it's like already there, you just need to access it. And what about establishing, like with these partnership announcements, I always see they they opened a channel between two parachains before the transfers become possible. Yeah. So uh, is there a prerequisite, technical prerequisites you need to establish beforehand? Yeah. Uh, in order to set up communications between uh, parachains, you need to first open Ash RMP channels. It's like a transport layer thing. Uh, message go transfer. It's like re it's related to uh, transport protocol. So in order to transfer by, by means of transfer protocols, you need to establish connection, uh, a channel. So as a parachain builder, uh, you should firstly open a channel, but it's like not a main purpose on the stock, since otherwise we would consume too much time. But yeah, you first need to open uh, a, a, a channel. It's like two-sided action. Both, both chains should agree on it. And once the chain is established, you add configurations to runtime, and it's done. Yeah. Thanks. Is, is part of that establishment at the beginning, establishing that link, uh, saying which, uh, how will you accept fees as a collator? Or is it completely up to the collator to accept fees from uh, parachain A, B, C, or D, or, you know? Um, it's actually not the collector who accepts it, but the network itself. So it's like uh, XCM Polit, it's like it's just a module inside uh, runtime of your parachain. So um, you, you define in your Rust code how to handle these fees, okay. and it's handled this way. Okay. Do we have any more questions for? Ah, perfect. Just from like a basic uh, interface perspective, I, I noticed that when the, the the first transaction goes out of the wallet and goes to the relay chain, the wallet balance changes, yeah. even though it's an inter-wallet transaction. I get why that would change if it was going to a different wallet, but maybe you know a user who's not as crypto-native might 
even though they're changing it just between two two different pair of chains in their own wallet, they might see a balance change and freak out a yeah, little bit. Yeah, uh, you can track it uh, because like each action, like most of the actions on uh, emit some events, so you can track like which events got emitted. Either it's like bal uh, on chain transfers or it's like XM. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So you, you can dis distinguish between them. Thank you, thank you. Do we still have any more questions? Yes, perfect. Uh, hi, thanks for presentation. Uh, my question is, is it true that if you will send assets to the incorrect location, the assets will be just disappear? Yeah, so uh, in XCM palet and XTokens palet, there are some sanity checks that prevent you from some obvious mistakes. Uh, we, so uh, as much as uh, it's possible, they check for it. But yeah, it can, uh, it can happen that you indeed uh, send something wrong. For example, the, the most obvious case in, is when you specify incorrect destination weight. Uh, so like destination chain will just reject the execution because it thinks it won't be enough. This weight is not enough to execute this transaction. In this case, XCM uh, has a special um, component called asset traps. It's like a place where you s where like assets that resulted in error ex erroneous execution got stored. Uh, it's pretty tedious to climb it from there, but it's possible. So, um, for example, if you send some assets to chain that doesn't support it, he will still store your assets to this asset trap thing, and once it be becomes supported, you can climb it. But it's hard. It's hard to do. It's it's complex to do it, and especially it's hard to do it from the user side. You, you won't be able to explain the user how to uh, claim his tokens from asset traps on another chain. It's, it's, it's a mess. Yeah, thank you.